Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning, Dr. PKV. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Uh, it's 12, but we'll just wait for a few minutes uh, to get started because usually we have a few uh, participants who always join in a little late. So we'll just uh, wait for a few minutes. Okay. How are you doing? No, it's fine. Everyone is locked down, so, but not knocked down. Still, you want to do something. Yes. <laughs> but uh, of course, you've been teaching very extensively uh, online. Now, the PGPM is also online. It's going to be a very uh, uh, challenging task. 300 plus okay. students and uh, four sections. How do we do? Some models will have to be evolved, even the online. So Absolutely. some common, common lectures where you can have a combined session and then tutorials will have to be individual sections. And you'll have to do that. That's the only way. Yeah. I know that in Chennai, uh, things are pretty bad, but it's wrong. Is it a, is, uh, they announced lockdown? Now interior, now interior, it is increasing. They are saying they are doing more tests. See, the data, sometimes when we see the absolute numbers, we'll have to also relate it to the population of India. And the data doesn't clearly say every day, if you make 100 tests, how many positive you have found, how many negatives. That percentage, if you are able to track, then you may know whether you are doing bad or worse or good. But I thought uh, this is the best uh, the country could do given the resources. And uh, people may be critical, but uh, it's the toughest time for any government to govern. Yeah. yeah because anything can be criticized. If you do something, uh, you should not have locked down. You have to uh, revive the economy, somebody may say. And in the process, if more people die, then they say you are worried about economy, not the lives. It's a very tough situation for any government to govern. And I think the public should uh, rise up to the occasion and support whatever the government does. That's how I look at it. Because what is the choice? Yeah. It's an extraordinary situation of the century, maybe. Yeah. I don't think this kind of event we would have imagined, isn't it? Somewhere yeah. it starts from China, the whole world is rattled. Look at the United States, they are struggling. They are more advanced country with all resources, but their struggle is more than India and all that. So very hard time. And they say that they have found some vaccine and uh, let's hope for the best. And uh, that could revive. But I personally feel this hybrid model online education, real time, virtual class, whatever you call a combination will be the future. There will, will not be a complete normal situation uh, of a class at any point in time. Over a period of time, people should get used to it because yes. social distancing will come. Even if you find the vaccine couple of years, they will say the classroom of 60, you can have only 30 and the other 30 will be forced to watch uh, live stream or something. Next day, you rotate them, bring them here. Something like that. Infrastructure, eating, lunch, social distancing with mask. And uh, you will have to, when you have to eat, you will have to open the mask. There is risk. Otherwise, yeah. how will you eat? So all these things are there. So that will be a new normal standards will evolve. Yeah. A new normal. Yeah. So Dr. PKV, I think it's uh, 12.05 and we have around, I think, close to 400 uh, participants yeah, yeah. who have joined in. Yeah, okay. So I think we can we can get started uh, now. Mm. Um, so again, good morning or good afternoon now uh, to everybody who's joined in. I've been looking at the chat and it's great to see all the different colleges uh, and universities that are represented here and the professors from uh, various uh, uh, departments. So wonderful to see you all here, faculty, uh, HODs. Uh, it's great to see you here. I think this is going to be a great session. Um, we will spend about uh, the first 20 minutes, 30 minutes uh, talking about uh, general questions that are interest to everybody. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the remainder part, 
uh, we'll focus it on answering the questions that you have. So we'll keep it uh, an interactive session. Uh, so with that, uh, let's get started. Uh, welcome again for uh, joining us. Uh, now, this is a masterclass on how to effectively move your classes online. And uh, we are going to take a case study from Great Lakes Institute of Management, which is among the top uh, business schools in the country uh, and has actually leveraged technology uh, significantly for improving student experience and creating a, uh, creating a very unique offering. So uh, especially over the last few years, uh, other than in the full-time programs, in the blended and online programs, uh, such as uh, the business analytics program, data science program, AI and machine learning programs, which have been offered in collaboration with Great Learning, uh, tens of thousands of students have enrolled all over the country uh, and sometimes from outside the country online and uh, excellent career and learning outcomes have been delivered for these online programs. Uh, as I understand, on any given weekend, there could be about 100 faculty members, um, both external as well as uh, internal, delivering over 1,000 live sessions to over 10,000 students from around the world. So there's a fair bit of scale here. Uh, now, this happened in uh, the online programs, but now that scenario is very real for every college and every university in the country because they're all going to be having to move online. So this is very apt right now. Uh, such a session would not have made sense, let's say six months back or even a year back, but today, of course, it's very relevant. Um, and all the colleges and universities will have to probably uh, do at this scale or even at a much higher scale where thousands of classes will happen um, you know, on any given, uh, or thousands of students will join on any given day, uh, taught probably by tens of faculty and hundreds of hours of learning delivered every day. Um, so that's, of course, a quick uh, brief uh, about Great Lakes Institute of Management. Uh, now let's talk about Dr. PKV. So Dr. PKV and I have been working together for now seven years. Uh, very closely, we've been working together. Uh, he's one of the pillars of the data science and business analytics program and has been teaching statistics, analytics, and other management subjects for over 40 years now. Uh, he's ranked among the top 10 data science academicians in India by Analytics India magazine. And he's been rated by students consistently as one of the most and uh, memorable professors that they have experienced. Uh, even at this age, he's obsessed about student feedback. And that's an inspiration uh, for uh, other students, for faculty members and staff. Uh, he's completed his MSc from and uh, PhD both from Madras University, uh, MS from Manitoba in Canada, and MBA from FMS, Faculty of Management Studies. Uh, we're very glad to have you here, Dr. PKV. Now, uh, although you have uh, 40 years of uh, traditional classroom teaching under your belt, uh, you've of course been at the forefront of this uh, technology revolution over the last uh, several years and have embraced uh, technology for online teaching wholeheartedly. Uh, however, many of the other faculty members are fairly early on this journey and uh, they are apprehensive about what it takes to deliver high quality online experience. Um, so in this masterclass, let's actually break this down into various uh, different topics. So first of all, let's get started with uh, the basic question. Um, how do you prepare to teach online and cover the entire curriculum for a course? So can you talk through some of uh, the components of online learning, live lectures, recorded videos, weekly assessments, online learning material? How do all these different pieces come together for an effective learning experience for the student? How do you plan to cover your curriculum um, online? Let me speak uh, from my experience and uh, perhaps that experience will be useful for uh, modeling the other courses. People who are going to do the virtual class or the online class or the combination. Suppose the, a course has 16 hours. Let us say I teach a predictive modeling where we cover some important uh, predictive analytic tools. And this 16 hours that is here marked with a very structured curriculum, it will be broken into eight sessions in our model of two hours each in a sequential order. In other words, the order is very important. What is the first topic? What should be the second topic? And that sequence cannot be broken because they are related. So the order part and a good syllabus and the learning components apart from live lectures will have a judicious 
mix of recorded videos, reading materials, data files, and assignments, which will be uploaded well in advance using an excellent dynamic interactive learning management system. In short form, you call it as LMS. Effective learning experience, uh, needless to say, is a derivative of an effective and powerful LMS with the state-of-the-art technology. And using this, the delivery of the online virtual class. In the virtual, they would have seen some videos also, it's possible, depending on the nature of the topic. And then they will take on and the faculty will import this in the online mode. This is the way the, uh, the online preparation will have to be done. In other words, a very meticulous preparation, having the complete syllabus and the course plan with the other components, such as what video should be used for what topic and the number of topics in a sequential way and the corresponding data files that will be given to the students for some assignments and all these things, including discussion topics, everything well in advance, at least for before every session starts. Ideally, it should be before the complete course starts, but at least sometimes when you have new ideas, every session before it starts, all these things will have to be uploaded. This is the way I would prepare for to teach and I have been doing this and I'm learning to improve and do it better. Yeah, so you know, at, so high level, it makes sense, right? There is live lectures, there are recorded videos, there are assessments that happen, let's say every week, all of these things are there. Now, actually, can you contrast this with what happens in the class? Let's say you've got 40 hours of class, yes. of let's say course in statistics that you'll teach in the, in the physical yes. class. How yes. do you plan to teach a 40 hour class online? Yeah, this is a very uh, interesting question and it requires some uh, deeper understanding. As far as the curriculum is concerned, let us say predictive analytics or statistics for a postgraduate program in management. Normally you earmark 30 hours for this course, a three credit course, 30 hours. This does not mean you are doing 30 hours worth the course content. Suppose the course has 30 hours duration, the actual knowledge impart what is part of the 30 hours, uh, you will not be doing everything and the whole thing could be combined in 15 hours in an online. In other words, 30 hours content of the full time, the PGDM typical classroom 30 hours can be beautifully condensed and covered in about 15 hours in the online efficient way because in a classroom, the time spent on asking students to do an assignment within a stipulated time is not going to have any learning component and there will be a, a, what I would call quiet hours or quiet time where you do not really impart knowledge, but you are waiting for the students to respond to do the assignment or problem in the class. So what happens is a 30 hour course can be beautifully condensed without sacrifice of the any part of the topic, any topic within 15 to 16 hours Beautifully, it can be packaged in the online. That's a very big advantage. In other words, you can even afford to have more content if you do online. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's in terms of the number of uh, hours. Um, now, it, now, if you were to think of uh, what the live session itself, so let's say mm -hmm. this 15 hours of live session that you're going to conduct, which is supposed to cover the equivalent of three credits as you talked about, Yes. Um, and then maybe you will give them for the rest of the time, because I think UGC might have norms around number of hours that need to get done. So you may still give assignments and uh, other things and reading material, all of that will add up. But this 15 hours in itself, um, how do you make sure that this 15 hours is the most effective 15 hours? Uh, what are some best practices that you use to uh, excite and engage the audience while delivering an online class? Yeah. So... The LMS part, which I said, the technology driven dynamic LMS part, which is an integral part of the entire process. While you are doing the class, uh, students are asked to, for example, you are lecturing 
and uh, suddenly you pass and then ask the students to access a file immediately and do an exercise in predictive modeling, say logistic regression. And what I do in the class is walk the talk exercise wherein the students do one full exercise with me step by step. And every stage we exchange the answers that all of us are getting the same answer. And the complete assignment, in other words, walk the talk, the entire exercise is done till the end and using either a software package like Python or Excel solver. And the students get a very good experience. And then we give, I give another problem, similar problem to the students. Now with this experience, why don't you do it? And it excites the students and boosted their confidence level. Instantaneously navigating many tasks using LMS is not possible in a physical class. In other words, you uh, sometimes in the physical class, the students are not ready with the file or something, or they have to quickly navigate from one end to another. And the physical intervention will be more there. Whereas if you have an excellent LMS system, that navigating and a smooth transition from one part to another instantaneously is really the hallmark of the online class. And in the physical class, of course, you can do it with some difficulty, but the online experience, so you can cover actually more content, more concepts you can teach, and the students can be excited because everything is in order. You can go from one to another, Suddenly and immediately you can switch on to a discussion topic and five, 10 minutes, uh, you can just talk about it and then ask the students what their views are. So the best practices would be an excellent course content, which is adaptable to the LMS technology so that the students can do the walk the talk, quickly access a file without any difficulty and keep doing it. And this is what I do in the class. Got it. And of so, course, we are evolving. Yes. So I have a few follow-up questions, especially from some other course questions that uh, uh, that people have raised here. So one, uh, there is this uh, question here that if there are no LMS at all, right? So I mm -hmm. think I'll answer that. The fact is that yeah. there are free uh, LMS that are there. For example, our own software called Olympus Digital Campus is free. Yes. Uh, and we can put a link to this on the chat on how students can use the Olympus Digital Campus. It's a free software that you can use. Um, and you can very quickly get started and use your, uh, you know, so that's no excuse, right? You can easily use free things. Olympus Digital Campus is free. You can, you can use it for conducting your the thing, experience that Dr. PKV talked about. Now, specifically, some other questions. Uh, one is around, um, you know, you, in the physical class, you can, of course, see the students, right? You can see uh, if they're understanding, if they're following. Yeah. Uh, you can get uh, responses uh, from them. You can ask the question. You get a feedback. But yes. in online, you know, you're not able to understand whether the students have, how, well, the question is, how do you understand whether the students have understood or not? How are you able to get to know whether, um, you know, whether, how do you interact with the students, right? Um, yeah. And so, so basically, how do you, how do you create that experience of interaction in an online, uh, online mode? Yeah. And lastly, what do you do if there are fast and slow learners? How do you do the difference? How do you, how do you actually uh, juggle between fast and slow learners? In the class, there are some tricks, but how do you do that online? See, uh, let me say, uh, this gives rise to a basic uh, question, if I can clarify and one, get a confirmation from you. What are some common challenges you face while doing the online class? And uh, of course, uh, and uh, how do we mitigate that? Can I take that, this, uh, this gives rise to that particular theme, which you like me to answer? Because you cannot see anybody. That is one thing, physical. Yes. The second one is you cannot understand the body language of the students. Because it is in the physical class, you can see that. The non-verbal cues also you cannot understand because it is an online class. And when the students are in the online, faculty cannot observe whether they have captured their attention and whether their instructions are clear. So this is a real challenge for the online thing. And the way to mitigate this drawback is many ways you can do. For example, I try to randomly pick up a student from the list and ask them, uh, the student to unmute and speak on the learning takeaways. Every 10 minutes I pass 
and what are the learning takeaways or bullet points and what do you think should be added further encourage the students to speak and motivate them and that is very crucial because the body language cannot be fully understood in the online no matter what we try here in this respect the classroom alone can give you the 100% correct picture but we can mitigate this by asking the student to come on the camera share the file any doubt whether we can clarify and speak and encourage student to speak and uh, learning take away so every 10 15 minutes you pass and try to mitigate this to the largest extent possible got it um so it's basically about uh, as you said uh, ask frequent questions uh, get them to type if you cannot um you know sometimes you encourage them to speak and so on right yes got it okay um so let's move on um what are some common challenges i know we talked about this aspect that of students uh, of uh, of a faculty not being able to uh, you know like see students but that that you also spoke about how to mitigate that challenge by uh, asking questions interacting every 10 minutes and so on but what are some of the other common challenges that you uh, faced while delivering an online class and see, the, how this, do you plan to mitigate the, that the faculty has to really imagine the attendees because you cannot see the photograph of all of them at the same time you cannot make all of them speak at the same time it's not possible and you can just greet them hello how are you and all you can smile maybe they can see the smile of the faculty but the faculty cannot see the smile or the other ways of behavioral response of the students because it is not possible that is the biggest challenge and only in the classroom we can go and shake hands here you cannot shake hands so this physical ambiance has the edge over the online in this aspect and uh, the only thing that we can do is periodically ask them to come on the video and show them and randomly you have to rotate it's not that you are asking the same student you have the attendees list and my, my dear siddharth or some name is there uh, what do you think of this point and uh, you can just uh, rotate the 50 students or so over a period of 3 uh, 4 modules each module 2 hours you can keep track and encourage them to speak but this challenge of physical eye contact is possible according to me only in the physical setting of the class of course using the technology after hopefully after the pandemic gets over you can all say that those who are in bangalore you can come to the class in a particular uh, classroom where which you can hear mark and they are all there then in the virtual environment you are speaking from some place but you can see all of them together if you can achieve that by the technology which is possible that is possible only after the covid pandemic is under control in which case people are assembled in a common place let's say bangalore bangalore people and then to a large extent you can greet them even though you may not have a physical uh, shake hands i'm just saying yeah got it um so let's go to the but right now is it there arjun you are a technology person is such a facility possible you can assemble them in a class in a classroom environment in a physical setting but the faculty is in the remote speaking to them and exchanging pleasantries everything where the faculty can understand the body language and then do some corrective measures yeah uh no i think uh, to some extent yes uh, you know some of the things that we are doing right now we can use for that but uh, but it's not the same as uh, where of course they can lie, they can sit in a class and we can telecast the faculty from somewhere else but you know i think what we are trying to solve is also this problem of students not being able to be in the class yes right so i think that's the uh, that's yeah, the that i agree i understand so uh, but, but that in this has... one in this one department if i have a thumb rule that 100% satisfaction in a physical class as far as the body language and the eye contact everything is concerned to a large extent you mitigate perhaps you may reach 65 70% satisfaction not yeah. 100% yeah uh yes that makes sense and that is a trade off we have to accept that because there are other advantages 
Yeah. Now, sort of related to that question, and I'll try to answer this, is I think from the chat, some students have asked, uh, some, sorry, faculty members, I'm used to saying students, but some faculty members have asked, uh, and I think it's a relevant problem, right? What if the student doesn't have great internet connection, right? Yes. So I think that is a real problem, right? And, uh, you know, there are some uh, work around for it. Uh, for example, now, you know, there are, um, like Geo, for example, Reliance Geo is very affordable. Um, so you can uh, you can actually get and if and many uh, ma like you know many people whether they are students or even from uh, economically weaker sections uh, they are watching movies online right so they are watching movies uh, and so if they can do those things uh, then I think uh, and they are using bandwidth then for that so they can I'm sure they can do it for learning as well uh, I think it's a mindset so I think there are ways to work around it I understand it's a technology challenge. Uh, but I think there are uh, ways in which you can get internet bandwidth or, you know, three, four of them can pool together and then, you know, attend a live session at the same time. Uh, so if there is a, if there is, uh, from a student's perspective, there is interest and there is a genuine uh, want for them to learn, I think these are possible. Um, and again, uh, we, you can use our software for it. I've said this before, it's Olympus Digital Campus. You can use that if you need to conduct live classes. Uh, or, uh, you know, recorded videos, we have certain compression and so on uh, in, in there to enable, um, enable uh, some benefit uh, for students to watch these sessions. Um, I said this it's a few, many times this question is coming. It's called Olympus Digital Campus. Uh, you can write to us. Uh, I'll have somebody post. It can be installed uh, as an apps in the mobile also, isn't it? Yes, it can, it can, be, uh, it can be installed. So uh, Siddharth, please have a way to post it in the chat so that students or the faculty can figure out how to at least reach us. Uh, maybe we can leave an email address here so that if they want to know, they can, uh, they can reach us um, uh, on how to uh, get access to the software. Um, okay, uh, let's keep going. Um, so we, uh, you know, understanding, we talked about understanding student senti you know, sentiment during the live session, but uh, when they are remote, it's not just during the live session, right? It, part of it is a live session, part of it is outside the live session. So how do you uh, leverage technology uh, for getting the student feedback? Um, and what do you do to actually uh, improve your performance as a faculty, as a teacher, uh, from, um, let's say, you know, week to week when you're delivering a, a after long um, class. So how are you, how are you getting feedback? How are you using feedback? You see, there are many ways uh, you can uh, accomplish this task. One of the things I do is uh, when I speak, uh, when I do the online class, the virtual platform online class, I ask uh, at every stage, are the concepts clear to you? Do you want anything to be added or you find uh, something not clear? Let me know. I try to deliberately uh, pause every 10 to 15 minutes and get some feedback so that a course correction could be done for the remaining 20, 30 minutes, 40 minutes remaining, whatever time. That is one. And then towards the end, uh, when the learning takeaways are there, I keep typing some of the bullet points uh, in the PowerPoint blank slide in red color font and keep typing it and speaking it loud. They hear with me and it uh, produces a, a very harmonious uh, type of a reaction. And then after that, I project it again and cover the whole thing. Then I put a question, whether they are happy with the session, whether their expectations are met and they just send in the chat box some reply or unmute and say they are happy, they are satisfied. And uh, sometimes they say that we will give you the feedback uh, in the normal way. And uh, some people have said, for example, uh, your pace is a bit fast uh, when you are doing the logistic regression, log likelihood ratio, I couldn't follow. Then what I do is the next opportunity, the next module, next session when it starts, I do the correction and remember the name of the person and then ask, is the pace all right to you now? Yeah. And I just say, and the other students also here, in that way, some of them who couldn't speak, this one student could be a representative speaker because other, everyone may not speak, but it gives an opportunity and the course correction. So the feedback, they would have given some rating and comments. 
After this course correction, I compared the feedback, how it has improved both quantitatively and qualitatively. This is possible only because of the uh, LMS and technology can quickly see the situation. Every 10 minutes, how things are moving are 15 minutes. This is the way I understand the student sentiment and nothing is perfect, but we keep improving. Yeah, absolutely. That makes sense. So I think, you know, as I spoke uh, about earlier, uh, that's one of the things that I'm always fascinated about you on how obsessed you are about student feedback, Dr. PKV. Um, and I think uh, that that goes on to show why you're, you're a great teacher. And I also, I also tell the students, when you give a feedback, give some reason. Don't say uh, the, uh, the, 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 about the faculty or the delivery. Don't say the food was not good because the faculty is not responsible for that. <laughs> so yes. in general, certain things happen. So I always say, be specific. If a particular concept is not clear, you write, it's not clear to me. And I'll be more than happy to address the situation. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, let me actually pause and take a couple of questions and I'll come back to the uh, come back to the questions again. So one is around, again, this uh, network in rural areas. See, I think we have to keep one thing in mind, right? So when we are talking about technology and we are talking about online learning, um, you know, the solution is not a perfect solution. Internet in many areas is not there. So we can't do anything about it. So we have to keep this in perspective and yeah. that uh, well, uh, it's not going to solve 100% of the problem, but can you solve 80% of the problem? Can it be better than, um, you know, better than uh, what exists? Uh, and I think the answer is yes. We can actually make it far better. You can get give access and you can give high quality learning to a large um, audience. Um, and uh, I think we have to be realistic in our expectations. Maybe it won't be perfect. Maybe it won't be 100%. But let's say we can get it to 80, 90% and then say that that's what we can currently do with the technology that is available. Uh, now, the second aspect is around um, the feedback. Now, feedback, one is, as you said, during the session, you're doing these things, you're remembering. But the other thing, again, you can leverage technology, right? For example, in our case, um, you know, the software that we use using Digital Campus, we collect feedback for every session. And it actually gives you very nuanced understanding of the feedback. And I've seen you pour over that feedback to get that specific aspect of what that student needs. So then uh, you can remember the student's name. And as you said, come back in the next time and say, that um, you know, uh, this is uh, you know this this person asked this question, and then uh, now is it okay for you? So that's what creates that magic. So now you've remembered uh, what that student asked for. You solved a specific problem for them, and you've made it uh, you know made it that much more uh, personable, that much more personalized. And those things are possible in online uh, learning as well with today's technology. So feedback is very important. So, uh, you know, with that, I think we are coming pretty much end to the end of the question. I'll ask you one more question and then we'll take uh, questions from the audience. Um, so today, of course, um, and not just today, but in general, uh, this whole idea of outcome based education, uh, ensuring that uh, there is assurance of learning. Um, so this is very important. So can you talk about how uh, you are uh, you are ensuring that there is assurance of learning in the courses that you are that you are taking? How are you tracking and ensuring this? Um, can you can you uh, shed some light on that? See, uh, before I answer this, one of the related things which you can do in the remote uh, type of an atmosphere, the student sentiment and encouraging the students and motivating them is, you can spring a surprise uh, when you are doing the session, have some uh, three, four uh, questions uh, maybe multiple choice based or a problem solving question and just say whoever solves the first uh, I will keep track and uh, then at the end uh, we may incentivize by saying that we will give you a book on data mining if that's a challenging problem and the shortest time somebody has solved within let's say three four multiple choice questions within 15 seconds or 20 seconds we try to encourage people and motivate that could be uh, something which I have experimented in Great Lakes. And uh, purely on a personal basis, I have done this and the students were through the online. But whoever solves first within 10 seconds, you don't put a very complicated question, simple conceptual. So that student sentiments improve in the online. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. So, so now let um, me answer uh, this outcome-based education and assurance of yeah. learning. 
as you would recall that uh, international body aacsb accreditation one of the things they look for is the assurance of learning how do you know that they have learned and uh, how do you assure, uh, 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 measure that so one is you set for example some target for learning goals using some metrics that is the outcome target you fix before the course for example aol or assurance of learning should target let's say at least 75 percentage of the students should correctly answer three important features critical features of logistic regression the three critical features which every student should know and if you have the system of measurement where that 75% and above is met that means the assurance of learning takes place and for example when you are starting let's say it falls short of 75% by a substantial margin let's say 55% then you need to look at some important causes take corrective measures to improve the next time continuously track students progress using lms help the students who are falling short of expected performance by additional tutorials chat discussion problem solving exercises and all this you do so that the magic number at least 75 you get by which you meet the assurance of learning goal and learning outcome and the assignments must be designed in such a way that the important features that you want the students to learn, learn is not lost and you develop metrics around that and targets and then try to achieve the targets yeah no makes a lot of sense i think there are some questions on this on exam so let me just take a minute and then talk about this um see there are many different ways in which you can do exams you can do unproctored exams the all the things that dr pkv talked about right now in terms of setting the uh, setting the objectives and tracking this you can actually do that online as well you can have for example again using our software this is why you need to use a software like what we've built uh, and we've built that over 7 years and it's available for you to start using it and you have to use it otherwise there's no way to do this online so you can conduct mcqs you can conduct subjective questions you can even do proctored exams and uh, we so the technology part is available so take a look at our website uh, take a look at olympus digital campus you can see the technology part but in terms of using the mcqs in terms of using the um, you know using the uh, subjective assessments in, in terms of using proctored exams and so on you set it up exactly the way dr pkv talked about so you can have very clear rubrics around those important things that students should demonstrate and then once they do the exam when you're grading it the the system the technology actually has the ability to showcase to you uh, whether as you said 75 80% whatever is that benchmark or threshold have that many students understood those topics so the technology exists for that it's about just understanding how to use it so uh, again i'll have to point you towards what we are using uh, you can take a look at that and then uh, do that so you can absolutely do proctored exams uh, there is software for that we have the software for it take a look at it you can conduct uh things like that you can check to see whether students are copying you can uh, you can uh, measure their audio and you can uh, monitor their video uh, and you're able to then take an action as to see whether somebody is cheating or not and if someone is cheating you can kick them out of the class you can you know you can uh, penalize them on grades what it is that you want to do so uh with that uh, you know the prepared part of the questions are over so now i'll uh, leave it to the audience uh to yeah. um, before, to have questions Arjun, before the audience yes uh what yes. final words of advice let's say that uh, i as a person would like to give to the faculty who are about to move to the online platform and the virtual platform yes. either fully or partially when the academic calendar year starts it's partially so i would say yes if you enjoy the online mode of imparting knowledge the students will begin to accept and enjoy the online platform after all passion with which you do will make all the difference therefore my advice is enjoy the online learning mode as much as you would enjoy a physical class then we will reach success yeah well said dr pkv absolutely yeah 
So um, let's uh, let's now go go through some of these questions, um, and then um, you know, and then we'll uh, uh, we'll uh, you know we'll we'll uh, we'll have another twenty minutes of discussion left. So there is uh, there's a lot of questions here on just doing practicals, right? How do you do uh, labs, uh, virtual labs? How do you do practicals? Um, so you know, I think uh, let me take the first uh, shot at answering that question, and then. And Dr. PKV, you can of course uh, give your uh, thoughts as well. So, in some cases, it is feasible to do labs. I think that is the honest answer. Like, for example, if you are teaching a computer science course, uh, you can obviously do labs online, right? You can, the software is there. Uh, you know, whether it's writing some code in Python or C++ or Java or whatever, you can do these labs online. You can share your screens. Uh, you can, if you want to give exams in Python, you can again using our software. You can. Uh, you can set up a proctored exam where they have to do the exam within that browser and so on, right? So doing virtual labs is feasible in certain areas. Now, suppose you ask me that, uh, you know, you have a lab that you want to do in, uh, you know, mechanical engineering, where you have to work on some, uh, you know, hardware or some device, and clearly that's not possible. So I think we need to be realistic on the type of the lab that we are talking about. And as I said, the solution that we have today uh, is not 100% there but it is definitely more than not doing anything, right? So that's the way I think about answering this question around uh, labs. So there's not much you can, unfortunately, there's not much you can do about hardware experiments. Uh, for that, you will have to ask them to come uh, to, uh, to the physical class, uh, you know, or you'll have to think of some way to give them to come in some small groups. Something has to be done there because without the hardware, without the devices, you won't be able to do that. Same goes for if you are from a dental school and you need to, have medical equipment lying around. None of that can be done, of course, online. Um, there's a question, uh, Dr. PKV, on some, you know, uh, online etiquette. So I think I think the question really is about how do you conduct yourself when you're doing an online session. So can you talk a little bit about, you know, what is that proper etiquette? What how you, I'm sure you've thought about thought about this, learned from a few uh, iterations that you've gone through. Um. You talk about etiquette from the angle of dharma? No, no, no. I think etiquette from the angle of, let's say, you know, uh, while you are doing this online session, um, you know, how are you going to conduct the session? How are you? Um, I think you talked about this briefly earlier, but more in terms of, uh, you know, just the way uh, you're carrying yourself, um, you know, I guess thinking about smiling more often, yeah. uh, you know, taking, being more conscious about, uh, you know where you are, how you are connecting to the audience. One of the things I am I am usually thoughtful about is I know that I right now when we are doing this session, I, there are about seven hundred people watching, uh, but I know that they are there. So I'm actually talking as if I'm talking to the seven hundred people. That's right? true. But in reality, I you know I'm just talking to a laptop, yeah. right? So what, how do you actually do this? When you know how do you? I, I, I think that's a, how do you imagine that the yeah. audience is really there? Actually, uh, and, the and efforts. Yeah, the, actually, the efforts required in the online, I cannot give a number. It's much more than the efforts required to do a physical class. That is number one, because you are not seeing anybody. You are imagining the audience before you and you start doing that. But one of the things I do to become more natural, as if I'm doing the physical class with all the uh, parameters that are required for a physical class delivery is my inspiration from some of the greatest personalities in the field. And perhaps I am one of the very few faculty members who acknowledge the openly the name and the person who did this. For example, when I teach a discriminant analysis, I start with Fisher in 1936, what Fisher did and what profound uh, knowledge Fisher had. And what uh, there is no area which Fisher has not touched in statistics and modeling. And the sepal length, sepal width, petal length, petal width, the iris data. So I get emotionally charged. Fisher, Morrison, Mahal Nobis, and uh, C.R. Rao, the legend who is, take, uh, who is turning 100 years this year, perhaps the greatest living statistician in the world, who is a fellow of the Royal Society and the student, one and only student of Dr. Fisher for the doctoral degree and uh, the statistical analysis of biological classification he did using discriminant analysis. So the inspiration, Paul Green, Morrison. So all these names I connect with a particular topic 
and I get emotionally charged. And then perhaps the actual classroom and the virtual classroom, the reality, what you call in the analytic world, the augmented learning. And I'm trying to close the gap. That's how yeah. I follow. And Absolutely. initially it is tough, but you have to imagine those gurus on whose shoulders we are all standing. Sometimes I feel I am not really the guru, but the guru, they are the gurus. In fact, uh, during Navratri every year, I keep those great books and the uh, Saraswati Puja and the ninth day, the 10th day Vijay Dasmi, I rotate some of the pedantic pages of the great books and I draw inspiration. And that leads to a better delivery. Yeah. And in so the virtual class, I'm still not happy. I'll have to improve, but I'm just saying. Yeah. No, this is absolutely interesting. I think the question uh, kind of related to this was earlier also asked. How do you actually engage somebody for one hour online, right? Uh, and I think the answer is exactly what you said, which is, uh, which is that, you know, if you are really inspired and if you are creating an inspired session and atmosphere for one hour, uh, then I think people will, you know, people will be absolutely fascinated about that and they will listen and they'll learn, yeah. right? So yeah. I think as a faculty, uh, you know, using, using the, the technology yeah. is a means to reach a lot of, uh, lot of people, a lot of students, but as it's up to the faculty to create that inspiration yeah. and that, um, you know, and that uh, atmosphere where learning can actually yeah. take place. Yeah. So I will give you one uh, more example before you start. I will yes. give you one more example. Then you teach uh, T distribution, T test, hypothesis testing. You can start with the T test with a formula and go about doing that. But who discovered T, I asked. And what was the circumstances in which that was discovered? So they, th there was a time uh, in the world of statistics when the sample size is small, standard deviation is unknown, but the samples are drawn from a normal population. When people are not able to solve, a scientist said, uh, it is called the student's T actually, because a scientist said, I can provide the solution, but the company said, you cannot publish this without our approval. And in the uh, non-disclosure agreement, you cannot do this, but he couldn't resist, the person could not resist the temptation. After some time in the name, nicknamed it, the person nicknamed as student himself and published it, that was William Gossett. So, then people enjoy the T distribution, a story around that. So storytelling right. perhaps is very, very important uh, in both physical and online and more so in the online class. You can put the figure, the picture of Fisher or uh, Euler or somebody and start explaining or Ramanujam. Then they get inspired. Yeah, so uh, absolutely makes sense. There's another question here. So let's actually take that. Uh, on uh, what is the mix, ideal mix of synchronous and asynchronous learning? So let, let me again try to answer that first and yeah. Dr. PK, feel free to uh, give a response if you want to add something more. Now, uh, there is, you know, it's hard to tell you an exact ideal mixture because different courses are set up differently, right? Uh, for more of the conceptual courses, let's say if you're going to try and uh, cover some theory, so if it is theory, then I think uh, you can do a lot of that using a asynchronous content, right? Because uh, it's mostly one way. Uh, you want uh, the students to understand some basic concepts. So asynchronous content works very well for theory. Um, you may still want to have I mean, maybe 20, 30% of uh, synchronous or live lectures so that uh, if students have doubts, or again, as Dr. PKV said, you know, if theory is very boring sometimes, so just to inspire them, to excite them and connect the dots, you know, you may need to do those as uh, live synchronous sessions to get people excited to, um, to actually go through the theory, uh, theory uh, which can be covered in the asynchronous sessions, right? In the order than the recorded content. So uh, for one way delivery, uh, recorded content is fantastic because that allows the faster students to go through it quickly and the slower students to go through it slowly. Now, if you're talking about more applied application oriented subjects, uh, then I think synchronous, synchronous, uh, synchronous, synchronous is much better, right? You can have some, uh, you know, reading material or videos that they need to watch. And then they come for the synchronous learning session where you take the topic that you have to discuss or solve or, you know, write some code or whatever it is. So if it is going to be about application oriented course, then you can make those application oriented courses very, very entertaining, exciting, uh, you know, stimulating in a synchronous uh, environment. 
But if you're going to have, let's say, one hour of just theory lecture online, uh, that's again one of those things that are actually going to be, uh, you know, uh, prime suspect for being a very boring session, right? So that's that's the way I would think of. Uh, there's no exact answer, but depending on the type of subject and what you're trying to teach, uh, this is sort of the uh, basic logic in which we actually divide what should be covered in theory in the in the asynchronous content and what should be covered in the um, in the synchronous content. In, um, in both the situations, you must provide lots of examples. You must provide. Absolutely. And uh, the examples reinforcement will work in both the situations you have described. So the examples will be much more in the online than in the physical class, I would say. Yeah. So I think, uh, you know, I, there is a lot of questions that have come. So I've lost track of some of the earlier questions. So if I've not asked something, I would uh, request them to, we have another, you know, seven to eight minutes left. Um, so I would request, uh, you know, to request uh, the participants to just post the question again. Uh, so I can I can see it. Um, there's a lot of chat here, so I'm not able to find some of the earlier questions. Uh, okay, so I you know while we are waiting for these questions, I'll again talk about uh, the technology for a little bit. Uh, you know, if you are interested, please uh, write to. Uh, write to us at uh, digital campus uh, at mygreatlearning.in. I think we've shared the link earlier. Um, so uh, digital campus at mygreatlearning.in, uh, sorry, .com, digital campus at mygreatlearning.com. Um, so you can take, you can write to us and we can show you uh, all the things that we talked about uh, in terms of how to conduct live classes, how to do proctored exams, how to use an LMS, how to track students, um, you know, in the um, how to track students in uh, in their progress when they are remote, uh, you can look at, um, you know, there's a lot of features that we built to look at each student's progress. Um, uh, and you can see how often are they attending live sessions, how uh, often are they coming to uh, the, uh, uh, the recorded content, how much of, their, of that are they watching, how much of the um, material have they consumed, all of that you can take a look at. Um, so there's a question on like whether to, it's free. Arjun, can I of... add a point? That yes, please. One important thing that, uh, that, uh, that there is more advantage in the online, uh, the virtual class is outside the class learning, I have seen in my experience, the physical class, you study the case and come and all that. And uh, or you cover only few topics, but uh, people do not really pay attention. Here, it's continuous, even offline, when you are there, you can go back to uh, take your time, come visit, revisit the LMS, see the recorded videos back and forth. There are discussion forums, additional reading materials, everything. Therefore, the outside class learning is much more successful, according to me, in the online platform than in the physical class, because they just uh, do not uh, pay enough attention. Have you read the case? If you ask, they are saying we have not read. Then again, you'll have to give 15, 20 minutes. They'll read the case. Whereas in this online, that because the next class is going to start on the case, they have to participate. That is a motivation. And then they come prepared with the, everything. Yes. Um, thank, thanks, Dr. PKV, for uh, sharing that. Um, there's a question here on how are, are, are short sessions better or long sessions better for uh, students, do you want to answer that, Dr. PK? What is yeah, your I, ideally? Ideally, a session should be broken. Uh, 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 the duration each session should be one and a half to two hours maximum. One and a half hours to two hours, and you will have to break the entire topics which you are going to cover in the one and a half two hours into smaller problems, something similar to what the deep learning does. A very complex task is divided into smaller tasks with which you achieve something, the autoencoder type of a thing. So you break them into that. That is one you'll have to do. And every 10, 15 minutes, you should pause and put some interesting quiz, one or two questions in the PowerPoint, flash it, use the fly-in mode so that once they answer, the answer will flash in the PowerPoint. They can cross-check that and pause for every 10, 15 minutes 
take stock of the situation whether learning takes place you can even give a break of 5 minutes after 1 hour and then say that we'll meet again during this 5 minutes why don't you solve this problem so the duration ideally should be 1 and 1/2 to 2 hours it should not be a long one let's say you do a virtual class for 4 hours it will not work yeah makes sense um this uh there's another you know i think there's some discussion going on on is uh, you know this uh, proctoring is that full proof see the answer is today no technology is full proof for doing proctored exams right because uh, students can get very creative about uh, cheating um, yes. so unfortunately uh, that is still uh, still the case um, and uh, you know if students want to cheat then they are uh, they are going to cheat um right so like for example we are recording students videos we have the we can again demonstrate that we are able to record students videos uh, we can record their audio uh, but if some and we are locking the screen within which the student has to take the exam but let's say some student you know while in that environment uh, has someone standing in front of them giving them answers uh, then you know um, uh, you're not going to be able to see that right um or if they've got their phone in front of them and just positioned it right under their camera uh and are going to try and cheat uh, then you cannot do that right so again the point is we have to think of uh, where the state of the technology is uh and not look for 100% uh you know full proof solutions right it really doesn't exist today and you have to see how close to the final solution can you get to with the technology that you have at hand um you know uh, and that's where uh, that's where you have to um that's where you have to do right now um so i think we are pretty much um pretty much at the end of uh, end of the time we have just maybe one or two more um uh, two more uh, questions that we can take uh, or pretty much one question so if there is like a burning question let me answer that uh, there's one around uh, what are the requirements of a digital campus um see ultimately you'll need a laptop you'll need um you know a fair bit of processing power not like very large uh, it's all all done on the browser but you will have to have um you know at least the latest uh, uh, operating software be it on windows or on um, or on mac uh, you'll need a laptop with the latest uh, software it doesn't have to have a lot of uh, computing power or storage because all of that is done on the browser but you'll need to have um you know you need to have basic software okay um i think we are pretty much it there then thank you everybody so uh, for joining um you know this has been a very uh, and, you know very exciting session for me from uh, the feedback that i've seen here i think all of you had a, a great experience as well from the comments that i've seen and i'm thankful uh to the participation that uh, that we saw here from the faculty members from all the different colleges and uh, universities across india it's great to uh, great to see you all here i think there were some folks from outside india as well from indonesia as i saw and a few other places um so great thanks thank you for joining us uh, thanks of course dr pkv for being here and sharing uh, sharing your vast experience uh this is always uh, you know i always enjoy talking to you because i at the end of it i think i learn a lot uh, on the amount of work that you put in thinking through um, not just uh, about how to conduct uh, you know online sessions but basically you know you were used to doing something for 40 years and now uh, suddenly you have to jump to a new technology and it's wonderful to see how quickly you've adopted that um you know i know that you learned python you know you've been at the forefront of technology so it's Uh, wonderful to see that and thank you uh, for sharing uh, you know your sense of adventure and enthusiasm even at this age with uh, all the participants today i'm sure everybody uh, all the faculty members learned quite a bit um and uh, as we learned today that live teaching is one of the components of an online uh, learning experience uh, it is an important one but there are several other things including tracking students progress doing exams uh, engaging them uh, looking at their feedback many of these pieces are important right it's not just about the one hour of doing these sessions so we've created actually a couple of resources to help you with this uh, one is the uh, website uh, digitalcampus.mygreatlearning.com so you can go there and look at the product but secondly we've actually put a blog there uh, there is about uh, you know 20 30 uh, at least half an hour to one hour worth of uh, reading to do 
several articles are there on many of the things that we talked about. We've written it up there so that you can read about how to use LMS, how to, uh, what is the etiquette for conducting live classes, how to plan for your session, how to look at assessments. All of this material is actually available uh, on the website. Um, so it's not just about it from a product perspective, but also from just how, you know, how do you do this transition? We got to this point after seven years of uh, iterations uh, and we've put together all our learnings together and you can quickly access that and um, learn from that as well, both the blog as well as the website. You can use it to uh, use Olympus Digital Class uh, Campus for your classes. I know that many colleges are getting started right now. Uh, so do write to us and let us know if we can help you get started. Uh, thanks again for attending and thank you, Dr. PKV, for joining us. It's been wonderful. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Yeah, thank you.